the ubiquitous cranes of China. As the joke goes, if Chinese developers have their way, this could become the national bird. And property speculation, a national sport. In reality, it's no laughing matter. A building frenzy, skyrocketing property prices, and more investors than there are occupants. The signs of a property bubble brewing in the world's second largest economy are there. How do loan sharks, interest rates, and mother-in-laws play a role in this bubble? China's housing bubble became a talking point as early as 2005, way before America's property market sneaked up on everyone and went bust spectacularly. We jet set to four Chinese cities for a ground report on what it means to be living in the world's largest property bubble. At Tungzhou's International Airport, it's not hard to tell what the major obsession in the Hernan capital of 8 million people is. Riverside location, move for your children's sake, golden vaults, limited units only, all golden opportunities just a phone call away. Such is the fervor for property in China that it's hard to imagine that barely two decades ago, owning your own home was an alien concept. In the early days of communist China, everyone was given a place to live. The Chen's stay here was supposed to be temporary. As their two kids grew older, they were to be housed at a bigger, better place. But within six years of moving in, Shula's factory shut down for good, just like many other state-run enterprises in the late 1990s. The family of four were stuck in their 15 square meter hut, the size of just three ping pong tables. The couple says their house is freezing in winter, sweltering in summer, and cannot keep out the rain. <laughs> When Sing Yen retired as a coal miner ten years ago, he decided his family deserved better. Since he could not afford an apartment above ground, he dug under. And this is the result a 50-square-meter underground cavern the size of 11 ping-pong tables, complete with a fully furnished bedroom, and even a basic kitchen. All this he built with just basic tools and pure determination. Sing Nian dug every day for two years. Yang 
To Sing Nien, the most important feature of his underground cavern is the natural ability to moderate temperature. In winter, Shula would go about her chores underground. While she can escape the chill, she is still reminded of the crumbling infrastructure above. There's no denying the couple would rather be enjoying their meal at a proper apartment, but it's an unattainable dream. Their combined pension of 2,800 yuan a month, or 479 US dollars, would not be enough to afford even one square meter of the cheapest apartment in Zhengzhou. Internationally, the affordability of an apartment is gauged by what is called the property price to income ratio. It measures the number of years it would take for a family to buy a 100 square meter home in their area. If they were to invest all their income into property, that is, if they don't eat or pay for any other things. The acceptable global average is around five years. But applied to the Chen's, their price to income ratio would hit 15 years, triple the global average. For the Chens and their neighbors, the best hope for a new apartment is if local authorities decide to resettle them and sell the land to developers. But for this community, the chances are remote at best. Their neighborhood sits right under the path of high voltage power lines. This makes building upwards impossible. But worse of all, it also poses a health risk. One UK study in 2005 suggests that children living within 200 meters of overhead power lines had a 70% increased risk of leukemia. The tragic irony is a whole new cohort of children could be put at risk, living in the brand new apartments built right behind Sing Yen's village, right next to the cables. In a city caught up in a property craze, it seems no location is too crazy for developers. Even crazier is the fact that there's already an oversupply of houses. Much of it in a brand new city, rising out of Zhengzhou's northeastern corner, the Zhendong New Area. At 150 square kilometers, it's about six times the size of Macau. This is Zhengzhou's 19 billion US dollar answer to Shanghai's Pudong. But in 2010, an American business website crowned it China's biggest ghost town. It is big, but calling it a ghost town is probably an exaggeration. Still, this is what the central business district looks like on a weekday during evening Russia. So, just how empty is Zhendong? Li Wen has an apartment in the Zhendong new area. She thinks all the units in her area are sold, but only half are occupied. It's 10 minutes before 10 p.m. 
With just a handful of apartments lit, the vacancy rate seems worse than Li Wen's estimate. In 2010, a group of students from the Henan University of Economics and Law conducted an occupancy study of the Zhendong New Area. Using utility readings as a gauge, they estimated the vacancy rate in the Zhendong area is 55%. An irony, considering there are still people living in squalor in the same city. It is a situation repeated in many cities across China. Often the empty houses are already sold, but to speculators who have no intention of moving in or renting them out. There are anywhere between 20 to 40 percent of apartments that have been completed are now standing empty. Now, that might not seem a particularly high number, but Thailand, on the eve of its property bubble, and Thailand took a decade to recover from its property bubble, the vacancy rate was just 14 percent, and in certain uh, segments it was 20 to 40 percent. So China is as bad as Thailand was, and Thailand took a decade to recover. So, you know, when the bubble bursts, there will be a very long recovery time. Despite the warning signs, China's construction spree seems unstoppable. According to a 2011 report by The Economist, at current rates, China can build a city the size of Rome in just two weeks. It's estimated that average property prices tripled between 2005 and 2009. Li Wen's family snapped up their apartment just as prices were taking off. They bought this apartment for over half a million yuan in late 2005. It has since risen in value to 1.7 million yuan, or 260,000 US dollars. This is This is a This is a is one of Li Wen's favorite drama series is Wa Ji. Telecast in 2009, its title is loosely translated to mean humble abode. The series traces the lives of two sisters, Hai Ping and Hai Chao, and their trials and tribulations in their quest for their dream homes. The series had 35 episodes, but was canned after the 33rd, all because it touched a raw nerve with the Chinese censors. For Li Wen's family, buying an apartment in Zhendong in 2005 wasn't just stressful. It was also a massive leap of faith. That's because in 2005, Zhendong was literally still in the middle of nowhere. By the time the area started to build up and families wanted to come in, investors had already taken up all the remaining houses. This explains the unoccupied units in the neighborhood. As far as ghost towns go, Zhendong is hardly the worst of the lot. 
Across China, there are more than a dozen ghost towns. And the most infamous of them all is in Ordos, Inner Mongolia. Kangbashi New Area is one hour from the current urban center of Ordos, Dongsheng. The Kangbashi New Area literally rose from the desert in less than a decade. At 35 square kilometers, it is at least a third bigger than Macau. It is built for at least 300,000 people, but has an estimated population of only one-tenth of that. This is Han Taijun, a neighborhood in Ordos, in Mongolia. It's about half an hour's drive from the Dongshan city center. It appears like an idyllic suburban community, but appearances can be deceiving. Many of the residents here are relocated farmers. The government acquired their land and sold it to developers. But theirs is not a story about land grabbing. Instead, most residents were handsomely compensated. Theirs should have been a happy story. The Bais are residents in Han Dai Jun. From the looks of their apartment, it was clear the Bais were well to do. But now the Bais get by by picking through trash for things to sell. <laughs> The Bais also receive a monthly pension of about 40 US dollars, a far cry from what they used to earn in the village. Aside from tending a farm, Mrs. Bai used to run a successful restaurant, so successful that when the government came for her land about three years ago, she felt she could retire and happily took the compensation. Altogether, she had about 300,000 US dollars in the bank for retirement. But with the property market all heated up, nearly all her neighbors were reaping high interests, lending out their money through middlemen to property-related ventures in an arrangement known as Minxian Jie Tai, or private loans. With interest rates of up to 30%, the lure was great. <laughs> The so-called Minxian Jie Tai works like the banking system, but without all the regulation or collateral. Middlemen gather money from ordinary folks. The sum is then lent out to businessmen and property developers, based on trust, and at an interest rate outsiders would typically associate with loan sharks, 30% per annum or even more. The buyers loaned the bulk of their money, some 300,000 US dollars, through one trusted relative. At first, it paid off. Their funds were reaping 8,000 US dollars a month in interest payments. Payments which they then plowed back into the lending scheme. But the good times lasted only a year. Suddenly the payments stopped and their retirement fund vanished. <laughs> Shuyanila. 
Wait, you can't. Mrs. Bai has seven children. She says they do chip in to help, but it turns out all of them too lost money to private loans turned bad. In all, the extended family forked out about one and a half million US dollars to different lenders. All because of a false sense of security that the boom would go on forever. Indeed, for a time, it seemed that the sky is the limit for the property market in Ordos. At its peak, apartment prices would jump 100,000 yuan in just one morning. That's 16,000 US dollars in a matter of hours. It was a classic bubble. Developers were on a building spree, and investors were snapping up multiple apartments on the expectation prices would keep going up. Never mind, the apartments were being built in the middle of nowhere. It didn't matter that there were more houses than there were people. It was estimated in 2011, there were enough new apartments completed or being built to give each household in Ordos a brand new home with 90,000 units to spare. The bubble was inflated by a continuous supply of easy money. Easy? because Ordos residents were rich, evidence of which is easily found in any typical car park. The wealth is generated by the discovery of coal and gas under their land. In 2007, Ordos GDP was over 10,000 US dollars, surpassing that of Shanghai and Beijing. After splurging their land compensation on luxury cars, many also turned to property speculation to grow their money. Others threw their money into property via high-interest private loans to developers. In 2011, it all came crashing down. That year, the central government rolled out a series of house-buying restrictions nationwide to cool the red-hot property market. Coinciding with the drop in coal prices, the speculative demand in Ordos suddenly evaporated. Soon projects were being abandoned. Unable to sell their apartments, many small-time developers could not find the money to finish the job, much less pay back the loans or even service the high interest rates. That meant financial ruin for many relocated farmers of Han Tai Jun. That's because having sold their land, many had come to depend on high interest payments from private loans as their only source of income. Da Fei Ban, or the Commercial Crimes Division of the Ordos Police Force, is housed in this office tower in Dongshan. For those at a loss as to how to recover their life savings, this is the place to go to seek redress. <laughs> Ironically, some of those here hoping for the police to recover their money are also the ones accusing the Ordos government of standing in their way. At a well-to-do neighborhood in the central Dongsheng district, we chanced upon a 54-year-old businessman who took matters into his own hands. He lost 6 million yuan, or nearly 1 million US dollars in bad loans. He refused to give his name, but revealed that he'd just returned from a long road trip in pursuit of his money. Oh. 
，呃，我呃，像他给不了我，这个没办法，以后他给我的车。It turns out his debtor was another fellow businessman who had wanted a loan to diversify into the cement business. But when the developers went belly up, so did the cement business. And it isn't just a matter of empty apartments. With people losing their life savings, emotions ran high. Soon stories of disappearances, suicides, and even murders began to emerge. But it's not just ordinary debtors in trouble. A recent Chinese report suggests the Ordos government owes some 5 billion yuan, or 800 million US dollars, to construction companies for work in Kambashi. Yet as if drawing inspiration from the Mongolian conqueror Genghis Khan, officials here are charging ahead. They plan to build another 600 kilometers of expressways, 14 industrial parks, and 18 power stations. How are they going to pay for it? is another matter. <laughs> Ying Ho Bao is a migrant from the southern part of Henan. He and his son operate a tire repair business in Zhengzhou. Their workshop? A minibus. Mr. Ying's minibus is parked at a major junction along National Highway 107. He used to rent a shop house here but he was literally driven out onto the streets by big plans for the area. The National Highway 107 runs from Beijing to Zhengzhou and onward to the boom town of Shenzhen, making it a key part of Beijing's drive to bring development from the coast to the central region. So here in Zhengzhou, the highway has been earmarked for expansion and the area cleared for redevelopment. The Ying's landlord was handed a fortune, but the Ying's as tenants received nothing. What's worse, with much of the area flattened, Mr. Ying found it impossible to rent another shop house to carry on his trade. So while the Yings work here, they live here too. Mr. Ying, his wife, and his two grandchildren. For the children, the minibus and its surroundings are both their nursery and playground. From the looks of it, the Yings are not alone. Like the Yings, many of these families eke out a living by servicing the numerous trucks that ply between Shenzhen and Beijing. They stay where they work. The thing is, most of these workshop homes aren't legal. The Chinese government has plans for the urbanization of its rural masses as a key pillar for future growth. 
Some say the ghost towns are in preparation for this massive influx into the cities. But those plans don't seem to work out for the Yings. At least, not for now. And it's not just uneducated migrants like the Yings who are finding it difficult to settle in the cities. Liu Si Li is a software engineer for a technology firm in Beijing's Haidian district. He's a fresh graduate, originally from Tianjin. From the looks of it, things are going very well for him. But Xili's living conditions are not those normally associated with graduates elsewhere. He lives in a slum on the outskirts of Beijing and shares this room with three other roommates. It's about 20 square meters, or the size of five ping pong tables. The rental for this room is about 400 US dollars. That's 100 US dollars each, or about one-sixth of their pay. And that's what he and his roommates can reasonably afford for now, in a city where property prices have hit the roof. <笑>那如果你爸妈问到 <laughs> Liu Xi Li and his roommates are members of what's been dubbed China's E2, or Ant Tribe. Named as such because, like the ants, they live in colonies. They are intelligent, hardworking, yet anonymous and underpaid. They are young graduates from elsewhere in China, lured by the prospect of living in the country's most developed cities. But they end up living in the least developed areas, because that's the only sort of places they can afford. <laughs> To city authorities, these slums are a problem. As property prices rise, demolishing these areas to sell the land to developers has become the win-win solution. Win-win for the city and property owners who are compensated. But it's a different story for tenants. They're forced to move out and compete for a smaller pool of affordable housing, in effect, driving up the rent. It is a Friday night. Celie and his friends are splurging on a nice meal at a local diner. For now, they're enjoying their life as bachelors. For them, marriage is still quite far off. Settling down in Beijing, even more so. That's because for a Chinese male, owning a property is a prerequisite for marriage. Yet buying a property in Beijing is nearly unthinkable. <laughs> Hypothetically, 
On Sealy's current wage, it would take 28 years to pay for an apartment in Beijing. It would take over eight years just to pay for the mandatory 30% down payment. So who is responsible for this ridiculous state of affairs? If interest rates were normalized, you wouldn't have such demand for property. As interest rates have been held 300 to 500 basis points below their natural level for the last five to ten years, if not longer. And what that does is it encourages people, or savers in particular, to switch into financial assets such as property. It is estimated by UBS that urban housing stock as a percentage of Chinese household wealth has risen from 18% in 1997 to nearly 40% in 2010. The share in the US in 2011 by comparison was 26%. But this outcome isn't entirely because of the need to invest. Property in real terms has simply become more expensive. For years, Fan Ting and her fiancé, Mathieu, have been trying to avoid hopping onto the property bandwagon. They've seen their friends become what is popularly known here in China as Feng Nu, or so-called house slaves. These friends would exhaust their parents' savings and surrender much of their income to the bank in order to own an apartment. First park station. So in 2009, the pair decided to embark on an adventure of sorts to get out of the system. For three years now, Fan Ting and her fiancé, Mathieu, have been calling a rented courtyard house home. The house sits in the far-flung reaches of rural Beijing. Both of them hold jobs in the city. Mathieu is a researcher in nanomaterials. Fan Ting is in risk management. Living here meant a one-hour commute for Fan Ting, but she feels it's all worth it. Uh For Fan Ting and her fiancé, the move out of the city was their way of escaping the housing bubble in Beijing. No exorbitant rent, no mortgage trap, no guilt from having spent their parents' savings. They opted out, but they had lingering doubts. In 2009, as the couple shifted out, Beijing property prices were seeing the start of a roller coaster ride. That year, housing prices in the city shot up by 50%. Tim Lee, who owns an estate agency in Beijing, witnessed the madness firsthand. 
，当在见面的这个签约或者说谈判的过程中，这个卖方的电话就是他的电话会不停的、不停的响，而且呢，甚至有一些就是交完定金、定金。啊，就是 deposit， 交完之后都签完了。比如说我交你三万块钱，举例，然后呢，你要是不卖这套房，你要赔我六万块钱。但是，很多人就通常过了一个星期说 ，OK， 我给你六万块钱，这房子我不卖给你了。你想买没有问题，你要加二十万。这都是真实发生的。Adding to the speculative fervor in 2009 was the government's economic stimulus package. Unveiled in late 2008, the nearly 600 billion U.S. dollar package was meant to fend off the global financial crisis. It was accompanied by a huge push to encourage banks to lend. A lot of that cash went into housing. 就是零九年下半年，包括一零年年初，就很疯狂。房子基本上就是一天一个价格，啊，那他玩的短线就很划算呐、啊，因为你这个可能一个月你的回报率就可能达到百分之二十，那做任何生意能能做到这个程度，而且当时的感觉就是说这个生意是只赚不赔的，所以就很多人在参与。来，咱们现在先来看一下，进来之后呢，咱们看这是一个客厅。All that buying and selling was pushing housing prices beyond the reach of even the middle classes. This city center apartment, for example, is worth 77 times the average annual wage in Beijing. Other apartments farther central and much shabbier were going for at least 41 times the annual wage. As prices went beyond the reach of the middle classes, and complaints mounted, the government weighed in. Between 2010 and 2011, the central government rolled out a series of property buying curbs. They included raising the down payment and limiting the number of apartments each household could buy. 那么呢，二手房买卖冲击还是很大的。一一年最多呃最惨的时候，我们一个门店可能有时候一到连续两呃甚至一到两个月都没有。When Fan Ting and his fiancée saw the dip in prices in 2011, they caved in. They decided to discard their rural dreams and jump on the property ladder before prices jumped ahead again. Maybe if you don't buy, maybe you won't buy for a long time. And for a year, you earn money. For a year, you earn about 10,000 yuan. You still haven't grown the property that grows fast. 这样的话，如果你不买的话，就相当于这一年的工作又白干了。那你你买房的时候需要帮忙吗？那时候？当然，需要家里面帮很帮助很多，家里面都是家里面拿出很多积蓄出来的，可能也可以真的可以说是可能是，可能是很大一笔积蓄。然后包括我自己也把我工作这么多年全部攒下来的钱都拿出来了。我们自己也是很很就很不容易买到这房子是吧？家里也把所有钱拿出来。就算完成了一件事情，他们很愿意看到我们住到新房子里面，这样大家都感觉好像比较有成就感。Fan Ting and Martier have since tied the knot, and are in the process of moving to their new home in the southwestern corner of Beijing, near the Fourth Ring Road. Their story seems to suggest that the Chinese government is making some headway. In squeezing out speculators from the property market and letting in genuine home buyers, but for a country as big as China, the same policy can have different outcomes in different cities. In early 2012, as the series of cooling measures began to bite in Hangzhou. Property developers there suddenly saw their pool of buyers dry up. Kunlun Properties was one of them. In April, ten days after seeing another developer go bankrupt, Kunlun fired its first salvo for survival. It slashed prices of its apartments by more than a third. Other developers followed suit, 
and a price war began.现金流不能断现金流断了只能把我们叫以价换量 For Kuan the discounts lured legions of new home buyers, but it also attracted unexpected trouble. Developers in Hangzhou, Ningbo, and Shanghai also suffered similar protests. These are home buyers who bought a unit before the discounts. Some were first time buyers and seeing their apartments drop in value by some 50,000 US dollars or four times the average annual salary of Hangzhou was just too much to bear. The group says when they bought their apartments, the vice president of Kuanlun himself gave the assurance that prices wouldn't go any lower. But他之前讲过一句话是代表是是作为他们公司的副总裁来出面讲这句话的，那肯定是有法律效益的。他讲了，他说一期的价格已经是最低了，二期甚至不可能有比这个价格更低的。那我就为了这一句话，我想问他一